Greetings, it's about like June 7th, I think. I'm out thinning apples today, and I've been thinking about doing an apple thinning video since I have to thin apples anyway. So I'm gonna do that today and talk about how I thin apples, why I make the choices I make, when to do it, stuff like that. They don't all set at the same time, right? The, the bloom period's long, so you can have clusters where some of the apples are small and then some are going to be real big and that can vary on different trees. But a good time is when most of the apples have reached close to a half an inch, maybe is, you know, this big or bigger. And before too many of them get to this size, the tree is putting a lot of energy into all these applets and trying to grow them out and you want to get the apples thin so it puts that energy into just the apples that you're going to grow out. However, you don't want to do it too early. Uh, there's a couple reasons. So you want to wait long enough that you can tell what is and isn't pollinated and if everything's like in this real small phase like this right here or like these sometimes it's hard to tell like I can tell this one isn't pollinated because it has that yellow look and it'll probably snap off pretty easy so if you wait a little bit you at least get time for damage to occur and disease so some of those things are hail we often have hail in late May, early June. If it's real heavy, it will damage the fruit quite a bit actually. So if I wait long enough for that to happen and then I can pick those fruits off and unselect those, you could get bug damage, disease, scab especially. So you'll get scab. By the time the apples are getting into this area, this size, you know, they're gonna to start to show a little bit of scab if there's gonna be a bad scab year. So when I'm thinning through here, I'm gonna look for things that are maybe damaged or weird. See how this has a little divot right there? There's another divot right there. That could be the start of some scab, I, I wonder. But I'm gonna take that off. So I'm really, you know, I look at the apples, I'm thinking, okay, this one's lopsided. See that? Something weird about that apple. This one looks excellent, so I'm just gonna leave that one. Let's talk about spacing. This tree is bearing quite heavily this year. You can see there's lots of fruitlets on it. Look over here, da da da, like up and down almost every branch and trunk, there are lots of apples. In this case, I will usually go with a method where you leave about a hand span or six inches between fruits. Like say, instead of leaving all of these, I'm gonna go and take one of these off. And this one has some weird bumps and stuff. It just it looks a little, you know, malformed. That gives me a better spacing right there. Since there's nothing else on the end here, I'm gonna leave these, these here, which are about, you know, maybe four inches apart. But down here, I'm gonna take that one off. Oh, dang it. This was an intentional cross-pollination right here and I picked one of those off. This happens to me all the time. I was on the computer ordering orange flagging tape, like neon orange flagging tape to tag these so that I can see them. And when I'm thinning the apples, I don't accidentally pick them off. So if I've pollinated a cluster, like say this one here, this is pollinated with Williams Pride and uh, I'm gonna leave both of those. It doesn't matter if they're malformed. I don't care if they look diseased. I don't care if they've been damaged by bugs. I'm just going to hope that both of those make it. You know, you can leave like a few extra and come back later, especially if it's your first time doing it and you're just not comfortable with taking that much off, which you probably won't be. Just remember that whatever it looks like now when you thin it, there's way more apples than you think there are. And when these start to grow into fruits, like let's say I let this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one grow. Okay, these two are so close, they're going to be touching each other. All three of these are close enough to be touching each other. So here, I'm gonna take that one off, leave that one. Oh no, look, I did it again. <laughs> oh. I should pick a tree that I didn't do this on. I could have wasted just as much as 10 seeds right there. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave that one, this one, and that one on this branch. It's only four fruits on the whole branch now. Let's go look at a different tree. Okay, this is the same tree, but let's take a look at how much fruit is on here. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 25. Probably going to be more like 27 or more clusters of fruit, not fruits, clusters of fruits. 27 fruits is too much for this branch. It's not that thick. If I let all these on here, it's just going to pull this down. It could even break it, especially when there's another scaffold branch over here with a bunch of fruit on it as well. So this is why you need to thin and also because of a thing called alternate bearing, also known as biennial bearing. And that just means that it produces a lot of fruit one year and then no fruit the next year. Now this is a natural tendency for trees in the wild. This isn't about nature, this is about us getting what we want out of the tree, right? By thinning the tree enough, you 
spare some of the resources of the tree, allow it to grow some, allow it to store up carbohydrate and energy for the following year and minerals and nutrition of all kinds, it will have enough energy the following year to produce. Now some trees tend very strongly toward biennial bearing and some trees tend very strongly away from it but it is a very common issue. Most trees, if left to their own devices, will fall into biennial bearing. This variety gets scab very bad, and there's not very much scab yet, and I just don't think it's gonna be a bad scab year. But if I see anything odd, like this little divot right there, that's scab, I, I wanna get that off. Some weird thing there, get rid of that. This one, misshapen, get rid of that. I just already went through this tree, but it's having a tendency to bear only in certain areas. So while I said, you know, I tended to want to have apples a hand span apart, like say like this, I left more apples on this tree because there just aren't that many fruits on the whole tree, right? Now, typically you don't want two apples to be touching because insects will often lay their eggs right in here, like the, the moths. Very, very common place for them to lay eggs. I will let fruits touch if I have hand pollinated the blossoms and I wanna make sure I get as many fruits and seeds as possible. Or if there's very few fruits on the tree, let's say it's a variety that I grafted a branch on and it's just producing its first few apples and maybe there's one cluster of three apples that are touching, I probably would just leave those three apples to ripen so I could try it. Again, a little close here, more like three inches apart. And then there's another one here. These two are real close together, but there's not very much fruit on the entire tree as a whole. And so, like here I left some doubles, but I don't want that double there. Another double there, I probably just didn't see that when I was thinning. So I think it's a good idea. I mean, personally for me, I find it a good idea to go through pretty quick the first time, uh, do my major thinning. Often I'll leave a little more than I should, and then I'll come back. I think it's a really good idea to come back because there's a good chance you miss some stuff that was just small, hidden under some leaves. The fruit starts to color up, it gets bigger, and you can see it. And you'll get fast at just kind of scanning over, There's the both of those were damaged, just kind of scanning real quick and going for the, the deformed fruits the quickest. This one's getting scabbed real bad this year. This is a uh, Muscat de Venus. Great example of a tree that bore heavily last year and is in a biennial pattern. So is uh, this here, which is uh, King David is real biennial tendency. This is Sweet 16. So this year it hardly bore any fruit. I was able to hand pollinate just a few blossoms that it had. But this is what happens. You know, I've let these trees overbear too much and they're under really harsh conditions. That's the other thing. If you don't have good care, like they don't have enough food and water, these are just growing in weeds. There's a bunch of suckers and you let it overbear. It's just like, it's gonna take a year off. You know, you have to manage for annual bearing basically. This is Wixen. Wixen is a very small apple. Usually it's going to be around this big. You'd be lucky to get one around that big, you know, if you thin well and take care of them well and the tree's not bearing too much. So you can see these have that rejected yellow stem, so they just didn't get pollinated at all and the tree's rejecting them. So in this case, I can leave a lot more apples. Like I'm going to leave an, at least one apple in every single one of these clusters all the way up and down here because I know that the total weight of those apples and the total resources they're using up is smaller because it's a small apple. So this is what it looks like when I'm actually thinning apples. Thin them at the pace that I usually go. I'm looking at them and I will bend them around and look at them real quick, but I'm not taking very much time because, you know, it, if it's something rare and you just have to have those apples or something, yeah, I mean, obviously you can take more time, but I'm leaving plenty of apples on the tree. There's tons of apples on this tree. It doesn't matter if I leave a couple that are damaged and take off some that are, would have been ideal because, you know, the tree's gonna reject some, the birds are gonna get some. I'm probably gonna come back through here, look at it again and say, oh, maybe I should take a few more of these off, um, take off some more damaged ones. It's just, don't obsess, don't be too careful. I'm gonna go straight for this one because I see a little divot on the side. I don't really, I don't wanna look at it any closer than that. This one, there's something weird coloration right there, out of there. If you see the yellowish stem and you kind of just bend it and it falls off, then that's, you know, the tree's about to reject that one anyway. Usually those will be much smaller though, unless you're thinning too early. So maybe when you're done, just kind of step back and visualize those as large apples. All right, let's talk about actually removing the apples from the stem 
which uh, there's more technique to than you might think. Uh, it's real easy to break off the spurs by accident, remove too many apples, you know, like end up removing the apple that you wanted to keep by accident, etc., and so on. So first off, there is a high variability between different apple varieties as well as what stage the apple is in regarding how easily it comes off. Some might just snap off super easy and you can just cruise along and other ones, the stem is just really tough and you'll have to work at it. Some stems are also very short. The really, really short stems, especially as the apples get bigger, they just pack together and there's really nothing you can do hardly but get in there and kind of twist one off at a time. Usually the first thing I'm gonna try is I'm gonna put this part of my finger right here against the stem, like I'm just gonna, I'm gonna grab the apple, but then I'm gonna slide my finger up like this. So I, I reach in, grab the apple, slide my finger up. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn the apple this way, like rotate it this way, downward, while pushing my finger against the stem. So I have opposing forces. I'm pushing the apple in this direction, I'm pushing the stem in that direction. At the same time, I'm going to bend the apple down. And again, since I'm holding the stem, it makes it possible for me to basically rotate the apple like this. So that looks something like this. Now what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create a, a bend to shear the apple off here and I just leave the stem on. You don't want to just grab the apple and pull it or bend it like this because it, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but you can often end up breaking the spur or doing a lot of damage down here that can have a negative consequences. So I will tend to do this first. Again, you know, by the way, this apple is pretty big, but there's just something, it's a little bit oddly shaped, and I like this apple better. It's more symmetrical. So the first thing I'm going to do is that, just like that, this kind of shearing action. It's very fast. Some people will use shears. So they're like sharp pointed uh, shears that you can get in. I think they're made for pruning grapes and bonsai and stuff like that. I prefer not to do that, but I could see doing that if you were, especially in a situation where you had just really a lot, you could eventually start to get, you know, sore hands and stuff. But with this method, I can just go along the tree with both hands and I can be working both hands at one time, plucking them off and it's actually quite fast. So I'm not gonna look at it too carefully. This is a good stage to thin out about half to three quarters of an inch. Um, I'm gonna leave a little bit extra because I'll probably come back here. The birds are gonna get some. I could get uh, damage still, uh, disease could still show up. Probably not, these look pretty healthy. So I've got about, um, these are four inches, those are seven inches, da da da. I'll take off one more. All right, let's take a look here. So I don't like to obsess about the timing on the apples. Like I said, it's a good, you know, half an inch to three quarters is a pretty good, I would say kind of ideal time. You can't come out every day again and obsess over like, oh, which apples are, you know, half an inch to three quarters of an inch and you're gonna just thin those. But this is something I don't like to see for sure, which is a bunch of apples that are well on their way to being grown. They're super crowded on the stem. This often will make it more difficult to thin them. And you've ended up taking off, you know, most of these, I might end up leaving two on this tree because there's not very much fruit but you know, you're throwing away a lot of tree resources. So right away, I'm gonna go for this one, which doesn't look very good. Again, the first thing I'm gonna try is to get my finger up on the stem and then kind of roll and push with my thumb like that, which it looks like that's gonna work. If that doesn't work, or if you need to get something, say, out of the middle here, which I do wanna do, I want this one out because I'm gonna leave two in this cluster, and I want the two apples that I leave to be as far apart as possible, you're gonna to have to twist the apples. This one, I can probably shear off but while I could easily break it off in here, I'm actually gonna, yeah. And then this one, and look how fragile that is. So this is a problem that can occur, is that once you start breaking this area and, and not shearing the apple off at the stem at the top here, you start to get weakening of the remaining apple stems. So chances are this is gonna be okay and this one will make it to fruition, but you saw how I just kind of touched that one and it broke because it was already broken on this end where I had to twist this apple off. So I do prefer in general to shear it off at the top of the stem and not at the base because look at all this damage down here now. Now here's a good example of the potential benefit in waiting a little bit longer. Uh, not necessarily this long, but you can see this patch of scab is very, very obvious. Now, that's not to say that it wouldn't have been obvious sooner or visible at all even earlier. It's just that when the apple starts to grow, a lot of the flaws will tend to show out more.
For instance, here's another example that's just misshapen, and uh, I don't know why. It's got these dents in it. It looks like it has some kind of physiological disease or it was stung by insects or something like that. Well, that's about it. It's not uh, rocket science, uh, but it's no place for dummy rules either. So this rule of thumb, though, of using the hand span is useful, but it needs to be kept in context. So the context in which this is the most useful is when you have a tree that has a lot of fruit on it and the fruits just kind of generally spread around the tree. So you get these limbs with lots of fruit along them and you do this kind of a spacing and you're going to do pretty good. Now let's say that you just don't have that much fruit on the tree and it's kind of clustered a little bit here, you know, a little bit there. Then you may end up wanting to leave uh, more like a peace symbol or this uh, symbol, which I prefer personally being a metal head. But uh, the point is that it's not about the spacing, it's about the total fruit load on the tree. You're thinking about like how much are you stressing the tree, like what can the tree pull off in terms of producing a crop and how much are you going to you know, use up all the resources this year and leave none for next year. And are you going to, you know, break branches by having too much in an individual area? So if you say, oh, this is the only branch that's bearing and I'm going to leave 20 apples on it, it's just going to go straight to the ground like that. Pretty much the same, uh, you know, adaptability kind of mindset goes with leaving doubles too, you know. So I prefer not to leave doubles because they often will get insects right here in between. But if there's only a few apples on the tree, I'll leave doubles. Sometimes I'll leave triples. I've even left, you know, quadruples, you know, just contacts in the situation if I really, really want that fruit. So after, you know, shooting the initial video and getting in there and editing it and then writing a blog post and just mulling it all over and thinking about it, I kind of come to the conclusion that a good approach for a lot of people is going to be gradual thinning. So you have this idea of like, okay, well, if the fruit if you let the fruit get too big and then you pick it off, you're kind of like wasting the tree's resources and stuff. But you know, that's kind of an ideal and life isn't that simple. So in the interim between say like a first thinning and a second thinning, you could get all kinds of stuff happening. I already have bird damage on my apples. Uh, by the first week of June, I had bird damage on my apples. So I'm going through and I'm saying, okay, well there's, there's a loss there. And each one of those I take off is one less fruit. So you know, if you can predict these things or you know what's going to happen, or even if you don't, it could be good to maybe leave a little bit much. Now this works really well for beginners because you're going to do it anyway. Like I still have trouble, you know, taking off enough fruit because, well, first of all, it's just hard. You know, it's like heartbreaking sometimes to just take all that potential fruit off. But mostly it's just really hard to visualize when the apples are small until they get up to about this size. Then you can start to get an idea of what it's going to look like. But when they're really small, you just it's really hard to visualize what's going to happen. So if you come back when they're this size, now it's really easy to see the scab right here or any misshapen apples. And then you can get rid of some fruit that's been damaged in the interim. And the amount of loss you're going to get from doing that, I, I seriously doubt is very much, as long as you do an initial thinning. Like with this one, I didn't because I knew I was going to do this video this year and I'm just put, putting off thinning all of my trees until I can get it done. So I would have preferred to come through here and thin this once. And then this is a great stage right here to come back for a second thinning. Check these out. Say, yeah, that one's got scab. That one's got scab. So peace out or bang your head or hang loose or whatever you prefer. Uh, but just keep it in context, right? Context is king and you want to look at the tree, look at the situation. That's the first thing you're going to do when you go to thin apples. You're going to look at the whole tree and say, how much fruit is this tree bearing? Where is the fruit distributed? Don't let that intimidate you when learning something like this because you're going to notice things anyway. I mean, there's observations to make. It, you know, say I thin the tree so much and then I come back later and I say, how much fruit does it look like there is on the tree? You know, how much is it just like tanking branches down? Is it breaking any branches? Does the tree bear next year? How big is the fruit? Because, you know, the more you thin, the larger the remaining fruits will get up to a point. You know, they only have so much potential, but they can get remarkably huge with good care and thorough thinning. And that's a technique that a lot of growers use on a regular basis to get high quality fruit to sell. Now to homeowners, it doesn't matter as much, but you can notice all those things anyway. And now you have a context in which to think about those things and a, you know, framework, which is basically uh, the thinning of the fruit early in the season. All right.